power, uh, usable power, um, how those relate between a race engine and a street engine. And I'm gonna show you a couple of shapes of curves. Some of them are not relative to what I'm working on and some of them are. Some of them will be relative to this sheet, but, but I'll erase them as I go. So I'm not, I don't wanna confuse you. So I'm just gonna go right in the middle here on my first idea. And I wanna show you what typical curves look like on a race engine versus a street engine, okay? <clears throat> a street engine has a torque curve that looks like this, okay? And you want peak torque to be in the RPM range that you run, that you ride, that you use it. You want your usable range there. So on an engine like this, you may have more torque than you have horsepower. So it's possible for the horsepower curve to look kind of like this. And we've seen those on the internet where you have more torque than you have horsepower. That's because, and these RPM are not relative, okay? I mean, get, get that out of the picture. This, is a, this would be a real low RPM engine because all engines, all engines cross here. This RPM right here is 5252. That's where the horsepower and torque cross on every engine. <clears throat> I don't care if it's a diesel, a race motor, or what. And I'll tell you what, like a pro stock engine looks like this. Pro stock engine has a horsepower curve that looks like this. Okay? And it has a torque curve that looks like this. And they cross at 52, 52. That's what a pro stock engine looks like. It has way more horsepower than it has torque. Matter of fact, the pro stock car guys that go 650s and 640s at 210, 215 miles an hour now, most of them don't even know what their peak torque is because the peak torque is so far below their RPM range. In other words, this engine right here it might make peak power at 10,000 RPM. And it might make peak torque over here at 7,000 RPM. Problem with that is <clears throat> on a good run from the start line to finish line, they never go back to 7,000 RPM. So the torque curve is irrelevant to a pro stock engine. Um, an s, &S 160 that we run in eight that we I ran and when uh, had a team up till 2016 We were turning that engine uh, 10,500 rpm and it had peak power at 9,500 rpm so it would make peak power say here and that would be at 9,500 and it was a uh, say oh 400 horsepower to give you a good round number 400 horsepower on a 160 at 9,500 rpm and it would have, at the bottom of the gears, oh, this is a little bit confusing. So I'm gonna cover these RPM up so we're not confused about it. The torque peak on this pro stock engine was over here where we don't run it. So going down the track, shifting at 10,000, and fall back to 8,500. Peak torque was way below, the torque power was way below the horsepower. So on the whole pro stock run, you never even see any torque numbers. From the start line to the finish line, the torque numbers never even make radar on a pro stock engine, okay? Now do a pro stock Suzuki like um, you see on TV now. <clears throat> It's more drastic than this. I'll show you what the torque curve looks like on a pro stock Suzuki. Let's say this is the same horsepower's curve shape, but it's at 13,500 where it makes peak horsepower. And the torque curve would look like this. Somewhere at half of this RPM and, and more left, they cross over the horsepower and the torque would cross over. Even though it's a pro stock Suzuki, even though they shift at 14,000, it would st still make the same horsepower and the same torque at 5,200 and 52 RPM. This math, 
And I've been over this before to explain to you why that's important. Is because <clears throat> your torque times your RPM divided by 52, 52 equals horsepower. So why is horsepower important? Because, see, the Harley world, what's really cool about the Harley world, as we operate there, that's where our engines run. Our engines run at 52, 52, or even a stock Harley. You buy it brand new from the Harley shop. To go down the road, you can twist it, 5200. Anytime you dyno it, I don't care where you get it dynoed. If you get it dynoed at my, my biggest competitor's shop or my best friend's shop, they make the same number. If that engine makes 100 horsepower at 5252, guess what? It makes 100 foot pounds at 5252. It's an inevitable, unavoidable fact. So, just if you get that pat in your mind, then you can understand why there is such an opportunity for our Harley clients to get horsepower that makes more power beyond 5252 or you get more horsepower below 5252 but then but you can't have one without the other you have to have the torque in order to make the horsepower now why is horsepower important in racing because the higher you can rev it and the higher you make power and the more area under the curve you use the quicker and faster you're going to go and um, if you go down the track from the start line to the finish line and you find your average RPM, that's where you spent the most amount of time. Try and imagine in your mind, if you could, if you, if you, had, um, if you went down the racetrack and you recorded the RPM from the start line to the finish line and you were to graph it out and average it, the fastest ET you could go would be where you, where you had peak horsepower on your, your engine made peak power where you spent the most time. Or in other words, another way to put it would be you should spend the most time at peak horsepower. Now, there are so many guys on here that want, they ask me all the time, why does your engines make more horsepower than they do torque? Well, it's because we find a, horse, a torque number, say let's say 130 foot-pounds or 140 foot-pounds. That is so much fun at, at 3,000 RPM. That's so much fun at 3,500 and 2,500. You want a lot of torque down there because that's what you feel and I'm not talking about full throttle, y'all. I'm talking about when you drive along and you just drive off from the traffic light and you go half throttle, shift, half throttle, shift, half throttle, shift. If you have a lot of power right in that range, you're going to be smiling a lot. That's why low end power is so important or torque. Our, our hot rod Harley Davidson industry has changed the name of this to, they think low end power is torque and top RPM power is horsepower. It's not. They're both still the same all the time. The curves are just different. And I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk a minute about the horsepower curve and what that means to us. Okay, I want you to get a, try and get a grasp of this dyno sheet I drew here. Let me move this stuff. Hey, welcome everybody that came in to watch. I see some guys showed up here a few minutes ago. I know it's early in the day for many of you. It's late in the day for us over here in Georgia. But this is a dyno sheet that I came up with that I just drew just to try to get you know, something, all right, so I got 80 horsepower all the way up to 200 horsepower, and I got 2,000 RPM all the way to 7,000 RPM, and the torque and horsepower curve is the same on this axis as it is on this axis, okay? Before I go any further with that idea, I want to share with you about area under the curve, and dang, I got this phone shaking good, don't I? Hey, Janet, I never thought you'd want to see something about a hot rod Harley. Um, okay, let's do it. Here's a power curve. Okay? Most dynos, most guys that dyno, will dyno and rev the engine up until it gets... I'm so sorry about this phone shaking, y'all. I am trying. This is where they stop. So that means that if you go to the, shop, go to the, go to the dyno shop and you get it dynoed, they'll turn it 2,000. And if they got a really short camshaft, like a 220 on the intake or a 230 on the intake, this thing might make peak power where I got it. What is that? 4,600. Let's say it makes peak power right here at 4,600. Everything after 4,600, it has a less of a number. So now... If you wanted to go fast at the drag strip or you wanted to outrun your buddies, you have to go past this number. Because if you shift, I gotta get out of this shadow. If you shift here, you're gonna fall back 2,000 RPM and you're gonna come to 
let's see, 46, let's say you come back to 3,000. So you're gonna come back to this horsepower. This will be your area under the curve that you're using. If you use first gear and shift it at 4,600, you're gonna come back to this RPM. If you shift 4,600 in the next gear, you're gonna fall back here. Shift next gear, you're gonna fall back here. Shift here, you're gonna fall back here. So this is the area of your horsepower curve that you will be using to accelerate your motorcycle. Now, I want to go higher RPM and I wanna go faster. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find the spot by experimentation, maybe a little bit of math, but I'm gonna learn it and I'm gonna go the fastest with this engine based on this information right here. You won't, let's say you get a 2000 RPM sweep from, from the time you floor it and you rev it up 2000 RPM and then shift, it comes back 2000. You turn it 2000 more, shifts 2000. That's the transmission ratios, okay? So let's turn this, this engine, let's turn it 6,000 RPM. And we shift here. All right, you can see that's way past power peak and it will fall back to 4,000. So now my area under the curve is this. So I have used a lot less area because I've over revved this engine. That's the 2,000 RPM sweep I have versus this one. All right, so I've overused, I've over revved this engine because now I fall back. Try another one. Bagzilla. Bagzilla's power curve looks like this. I want to turn it more than that. So what we used to, what I was doing when I was going fast on it, is I was shifted at 8,000, which is over here. So this engine's falling off. I'm gonna tell you what's cool about it. I was shifted at 8,000, and it would come back to 6,000. So. From the starting line to the finish line, my average RPM was about 7,100. And at 7,100, I had the most horsepower. I had 180 horsepower, and I went past it and fell back below it, went past it and fell back below it, and went past it and fell back below it. So now the fact that I went five gears down the track running 7,500, 7,600, 7,100, 7,000, I'm sorry, 7,000 RPM average, I was able to go 10 bikes quick 10 bikes further than my competition in every year because he would be shifting maybe back here because he wanted to have more torque than me. So my competition was focusing on torque and then he would, he would try and stay in his torque range and his 2000 RPM, he would be in this torque range. So he would shift here, fall here, shift here, fall here. Guess what his average horsepower for his run was? Hundred sixty horsepower. So he spent the most time at one hundred sixty horsepower, and I spent the most time at one hundred eighty horsepower. And the only reason I could get one hundred eighty horsepower is because I was to built the engine to rev higher, and the torque curve was way lower. If I can remember it off the top of my head, this is basically what Bagzilla's dyno sheet looked like. That's what the horsepower curve looked like on Bagzilla. Okay. So 135, I turned it 8,000, 7,800 when I was being nice to it, and it would make almost 180 to 190 horsepower. But the torque curve was irrelevant. It made, at 5,200, it made the same, at 5,200, it made the same, so it, where they cross is right here. So my torque curve, would make the same number at 5,252, but it was so far out of the picture when I was racing against people with Bagzilla or trying to go low time or qualify on the pole, I was shifting here. And as you can see, peak torque is totally to the left and never relevant. So if I'd never raced any of my hot rods or racing engines based on how much torque it had. And, I, and don't hear me, hey, don't quote George saying that he says torque ain't important. No, 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 no. It's the range you want to run. If you want to run your bike at 2,000, 3,000, that's the majority where you run it, you want it to have the most power there. And you can't have one without the other. You can't have the most horsepower 
at 3,000 RPM and, and 4,000 RPM without having the most torque. Because any time it's below 5,252, any time it's below 5,252, it has more torque than it has horsepower. And if and if you if you build an engine that breathes good at high RPM, any time past 5,200 RPM, it's going to make more horsepower than torque. And I wanted to answer that question because I have a lot of people ask me all the time, why do your dyno sheets look like that? Well, then, then I get the guys that call me all the time and they say, George, I don't want a racing bike. I want a touring bike. Okay, great. I love it. I had to take a drink break there right quick. So I love that. That's what you want. Let's, let's build that on the dyno sheet. How much torque do you need to have fun on the street? Well, the answer is I want a lot. I want all I can get. I'm going to say 140 is enough. Let's say 140 can happen at 4,000. That's right here. Okay. Now, if you don't want it to make top end power and you want to make it all on this side, we got to put a short cam in it. And as soon as you get up to 5,000 or 6,000, it's going to start falling over. That's what the torque curve looks like. Now look how good it is to the left. This is where you ride. You ride 2,000, 3,000, you ride in this range. And there's a lot of torque in here. So that feels really good when you're going, on, on, on. You, can, you don't have to floor it. You don't have to rev it up. You can just feel the power. It feels like a really big cubic inch engine. And that's true. But please also understand that in order to make power this early, and when I say early, I'm talking about in a range, RPM range. In order to make power this early, you have to have a smaller camshaft. And when I say smaller, I'm not talking about lift. I'm talking about how long the valve is open. You want to close the intake valve sooner to trap more air early in the rev range. If you want to make more power here and go faster, quicker through the gears at, and you rev it up, is you got to put a later intake closing so that you trap more air up here. But they're always still going to cross at 5252. I got to draw that better. I missed. Here's 5252. So it's going to have a little different deal. And this one will not be that much torque. This torque will change because you can't have both. You can't have torque and horsepower unless you're running at 5,200 5, RPM. You can have the same. You can have 140 horse, 140 torque at 5,200. But if you want more than 140, you're going to have to shut the valve, intake valve sooner and have it to the left of 5,200. Or if you want it more power, higher in the rev so you can go faster, <clears throat> you want to close it later till you trap more air to the right of 5,200. So the torque curve, let me make sure I can do this right. It's got to be the same here. So these numbers have to cross here. So I think it's going to be less torque and it's going to fall off fast. But how much torque does this have? This motor still has 120 foot pounds. So let's talk, I, I got off track. Let's, let's go back to the touring engine. Because out of everything we do at Star Power, at Star Racing Power, is we build our Thrasher kits. And our Thrasher kits are to make your Harley do everything a star Harley, stock Harley will, but way better. In other words, if you make 100 horsepower with your Harley, we want to make 100 horsepower at 50% throttle. Okay? That means we're trapping so much air, you don't even have to floor it. People come to the shop all the time, and they say, why do you want so much power? I said, I don't use it. I, don't, I, don't, I just want it if I need it. I mean, what would be wrong with saying, I have a lot of power, but I only use it every now and then, and I'm going to drive it just like a stock motorcycle. So the guys that have 130 horsepower thrasher kits in their twin cams and 140, 150 horsepower thrasher kits in their Milwaukee 8s that we build here, they don't floor it all the time. If they wanted to, they could, and it won't hurt it. But if you want to drive around on the highway, go to Daytona, go to Sturgis, wherever you want to go and ride around, go through the mountains, go through the twisties, you're going to need a lot of power to the left. That makes the bike more fun. I'm, my point is here is you can't have both. Can't have both because one of them is going to be a super high RPM rever that pulls like a freight train. The higher your rever, the harder it pulls. You can ask that, that, that Lee, I mean, uh, Larry Westerfield that bought the him and Chuck and Tammy bought uh, Bagzilla. You ask them how hard that bike pulls. It never stops. He told me when he rode it the first few times, he said his abs hurt, his legs hurt, he got sore like he'd been running in a sprint race or something because it's trying to pull him off of it. The higher you rev it, the harder it pulls. Did I, did, what was the torque? I don't know. I never checked it. I didn't care. 
I know I got, I worked hard to try and make 190, 200 horsepower, but I wanted to make it at 7,500 and 8,000 and the torque was little and it was over here. I never went below 5,250 RPM is where the horsepower and the torque were exactly the same number. I never went there. I only went from there to here. So I always had more horsepower here. There's, there's way easier ways. There's way easier ways to explain this, I guess, but I thought if I drew a dyno sheet and made some curves, I could help you understand it. But area under the curve, you need the most area under your curve in your operating zone. But you, the client, you, the customer, you, the hot rodder, race car, street car, dirt bike, I don't care, whatever you race, whatever you have, whatever you want to hot rod, 396 Chevelle, 550 cubic inch, Kawasaki, Suzuki, it doesn't matter. Pick out the range that you want it to be good and design the engine to run in that range. Um, I see a couple guys, one asked me, if the horsepower flattens out but doesn't fall off, when do you shift? Well, you, you're lucky. If it flattens out, you want to stay where it's the most, the most time. Think about those words I said. You want the most power, the most amount of time. So if you keep going... This way, on the RPM, until it noses over and you shift and it goes back 2,000 RPM. If that number is the same horsepower as the one where you shifted, you have done all you can do. You are maxed out. If you're going this way and it doesn't nose over and you shift and you go back this way, your average is going to be lower power under your curve. See, I don't care if it's a pro stock motorcycle, pro stock car a hot rod Harley, they all run in different ranges. This Harley range I got drawn on this dyno sheet. I got 2,000 to 7,000. We all want power at 2,000. If you have really low power at 2,000, the thing feels like a dog, man. You wanna put a smaller pulley on the front, it's gonna be hard to drive. It wants to be chugging along and maybe stumbling down low RPM because let me tell you something, the camshaft that makes power here, it doesn't run good right here. And if you'll, if you'll listen to this statement, I'm going to tell you, whatever camshaft you pick, it's only good for one RPM. One RPM past that, it's too small. One RPM below that, it's too small. I mean, it's too big. One RPM below that, it's too big. One RPM above that, it's too small. And why is that? Well, you can't, without variable cam timing, which is the rage in the automotive industry and some of the motorcycles now, without variable cam timing... You can't have that many power peaks. We in, in our hot rod Harley world right now today and in our um, hot rod uh, Chevys and Fords and Chryslers and all the Mopar stuff and all the cool engines out there, we pick out one RPM where we want to make the peak power. Now, if we want it to be the most we can be for the longest period of time, and the way you go fast, car racers, motorcycle racers, and hot riders, is to be at the most power for the most amount of time. Pro stock, that's how we set records. That's how we went fast. We stayed at peak power the longest amount of time. Um, on the pro stocker, we, 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 not, we, we, were able, we had an advantage that a lot of people don't look at, but most every race pack data logger, V300 or whatever you use now, has a G-meter on it. Most guys look at it kind of with crossed eyes, but the G-meter is the, it's the dyno. The G meter says it's making power at that RPM or it's not making power at that RPM. So the G meter is our, um, our captain. It's the, it's the judge. On a pro stock engine, if we re they, they say you got to shift at 13.8. Well, guess what? If it's nosed over at 13.8 and you shift to the next gear and the G meter's higher, that means you over revved it. And if you shift and the G meter's still going up, you've left performance and, and, and ET on the table. I'm trying to say this good enough for you to understand, but... The G meter is um, something everybody doesn't have, but the dyno sheet is our next best and um, you know indicator. And then people ask me, say, man, you, you can feel it. I feel the motor nose over. Well, if you feel it nosing over, guess what? You're over revved. <laughs> I'm just telling you, you are over revved. And uh, back when I started racing Harleys, it used to be put a lot of stroke in it, short shift it, stay in the torque peak. Yeah, if, that, if all you could turn was 4,500 RPM, you better stay in the torque peak because you don't have no RPM. You don't have any horsepower, I mean. The horsepower on a, on a long stroke choked engine where it doesn't have any good airflow, it has 
camshaft's too big to make up for it, you're in a real trouble zone because you have no RPM to make power and you have too much cam timing to make power down low. So you just have a very inefficient piece that it doesn't, doesn't um, impress anyone, spectators, riders, owners. It just, it's not. The impressive thing you can do is really focus on the area under the curve. And all of us have it. A dyno sheet goes here and you stop. I stop so I don't blow the thing up. But if I'm racing it and it's mine, I'm gonna keep going over here. I'm gonna find this. So I'll know where to shift it. It's over there to the left. And right here, if, you're, if we dyno it for you and it's making power right there, I probably set the rev limiter right there because I don't want you to blow it up. I want it to last a long time because one thing you're going to come back to me and say, man, that thing didn't last but a minute, but it sure was fast. I've never had anybody say that. I've always had a guy come back to me four years later, five years later, and he says, my bike is so fast and it's just been like a train. It just keeps performing. I, I depend on it and it impresses me. Well, if you're blowing up or tearing up, you cannot uh, sell that. It's just not something you sell. You sell something that'll last long enough where you bump it into the guy several years later and he's still happy. That's what you sell. But it has to be fast enough to impress him. It has to be dependable and it has to be impressive. So when I ride a new Harley that we just finished building, I want it to impress me and I want to count on it being able to take me where I'm going and come back. Now, we use titanium valves a lot in our shop because we want to rev it up. And the valve springs and the push rods and the rock arms and the lifters and the cams and the cam chests and all the bearings, they hate big valves. They hate heavy valves because you can't control them as well as you can lightweight valves. So there's a new technology that's so nice and so good, you get the chrome-plated CRN-coated titanium valves and it wears like stainless. It's hard to wear. They're hard as a rock and they're very light and the valve springs will smile for a while. They enjoy running that high. The Bagzilla had 30% uh, lighter valves than the big stuff so that we could rev it up. And when you know it's working, that's when you rev it up and it keeps going this way. And if you can't stand the rip, you can't stand the RPM anymore, you got to shift. But if you want to keep going, keep going. But I'm going to tell you something. The further you go with a V-Twin Harley or a... Um, Milwaukee 8 or a twin cam, the further you go this way, the less time you're going to have to have fun with it because it doesn't last very long. It doesn't last very long. The higher you rev it, the shorter the time it lives. So Harleys, typically, everything is built in this window. And that is the majority of the work we do here. Yes, we're very fortunate to get work on some high performance and racing engines, and we learn a lot doing that, but that exercises... The 20, 30 years we've had in pro stock where we studied airflow and trapping. Think about that word, airflow and trapping. The cylinder heads and the valves and the intake manifolds and the throttle bodies and the and exhaust pipes handle the airflow, but the trapping is controlled by the camshaft. So when you get a lot of airflow and you better trap it to where you make the power. You want to trap it in this range you want to trap it in this range or you want to trap it in this range. That's very, very, very important. The guy asked just now, he says, does clutch slipping at higher RPM happen? Well, typically not unless, unless the engine is building more torque higher up. But like on Bagzilla, we didn't ever slip the clutch and we could run a stock clutch, which everybody called baloney on that, but, but because they build their engines to run here and there's so much torque available in this range that you have to put a lock up on it, you have to run some AIM thing, or you have to run something to clamp the torque load. But if you have a high RPM engine here, the torque is so low at high RPM, it's going this way. So the higher you rev it, the less clutch slip you have, unless you have everything timed to make the most power over here. I'm gonna tell you something, if you check out 100 Hot Rod Harleys at Daytona or Sturgis or anywhere, all of them are built to run right here in this window. Right in here. There's a lot of torque here. If you've got the trapping and the airflow right, there's a lot of torque that gets captured right here and it will blow right through the clutches. That's why the market is so big for 
uh, clutch springs, clutch plates, lockups, AIMs. I mean, those guys have a great market because they're working in the 99 percentile of the Harley customers right in this range. The guys are going to go really fast. They're over here. And I'm not going to say, George said, I cause my bike only turns 5,008 fast. No, 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 no. It's going to go faster if you flow more air over here and you trap the air here. It's going to go faster in this range if you flow a lot of air and you trap the air here. That's cam timing, y'all. It changes. Like we have, we have uh, cams on the market that we use and we close the intake at 30 degrees after top dead center. Nope, start over. 30 degrees after bottom. That's after the piston's gone down and stopped, and then it starts to come back around. And if you close that valve at 30 after bottom, you're trapping a lot of air at low RPM. If you tried that cam over here, it wouldn't even rev up that high. It wouldn't even make it over here because the valve's gonna close too soon and you didn't get to get enough gulp to rev it up. So there are camshafts out there to close the intake valve Check this out. This is crazy. Close the intake valve at 90 degrees after bottom. 30 will trap the air early in the range. A 90 will trap the air over here. Yes, yeah, off the page. So somewhere between 30 and 90 is where the rest of the world lives. A really good number for Harley's twin cams is 40. There's some guys out there running 60. That's closing the valve. So here's how it works. Piston goes down, intake stroke. Piston turns around and comes back up. When the pressure in the cylinder and the pressure in the, in the, on the, at the intake valve, they're equal, the air coming in and the piston going up. As soon as those, pressure, those pressures equalize, you slam that valve shut right then and then you get the most air trapped at the RPM range you wanna run. Pro stock guys are running some, closing it 90 after bottom. Listen to me about 90. That is so late in the RPM that the piston goes down on the intake stroke, turns around and comes back up, and it's halfway back to the top before the valve shuts. That means that it's happening over here. That's a little bit graphic, but that's how it works. Hey, somebody give me the time. Hey, Jack, you got a clock? Daddy, that was fun. Man, there's so many great questions. Um, there's still 90 to 100 people watching. I'm very thankful for you guys to come in here and look at all this stuff. I know it's a pretty wide range. In case you were worried, there's the AARP calculator. Oop, those are secret notes. You can't see that. And then there's the 70 millimeter throttle body for the um, from HPI. But look, I'm going to say bye. Uh, there's a lot of people scared out there now because of the, uh, the viruses going around and um, everybody Please look after each other. If you don't feel too good, man, stay home. Try not to spread it We need to spread love. We don't need to spread a virus. I'm uh, thankful for you guys. Thank you so much for following me Thank you for asking me questions. I got a great response from you guys today on suggestions to talk about it My trouble is is I don't know how to stop and move on to the next one. I get one guy, a friend of mine told me one day, he said, dude, you are just running the pattern. You need to land the plane, man. You need to move on to the next trip. Quit flying around the airport. So look, I'm going to land the plane. I love y'all. Thank y'all so much. May God bless y'all. Please follow. Send me information. Send me questions. Tell me what you like. You, what you say is my feedback. That feeds me back. And then I'll have more info to share with you. God bless. Bye.